First on BBC One, Jill Dando and Nick Ross present this month's edition of Crime Watch UK. Progress on two cases within hours of last month's programme and a third within three days. All men are either being questioned or have been charged with serious sexual offences. And within ten days of the January Crime Watch, a further arrest, a man recognised by a highly observant viewer has been charged with a series of deceptions. This month, what seems like a contract killing, but was it business or something personal? A rather clumsy gang who may be involved in a string of jewellery heists across the north of England. And what's described as a bizarre and disturbing crime, which experts fear may be repeated if it isn't solved. But we start with a murder that made headlines over the new year. In fact, it happened on New Year's Eve. Nicola Dixon was just 17. She'd been to a New Year's party with friends at a social club near her home in Sutton Coldfield in the West Midlands. This is a photo actually taken that evening just before she left to go out. Well, after leaving the social club at about 10 o'clock in the evening, she went on to the station pub, but she never arrived. Her body was found at a place called Trinity Hill, outside the Holy Trinity Church. She died from massive head injuries. Well, Nicola's funeral was last Wednesday, and obviously there's still a huge sense of shock in Sutton Coldfield. DCI Kelvin Roberts, now this is a crime which has warranted a lot of publicity, it's got a lot of publicity, mostly about Nicola's last movements. What are you hoping that viewers can, can tell you tonight? There's people that we need to eliminate from this inquiry. We ha have had a tremendous response from members of the public, but I say there are people we now need to eliminate. Now one sighting has come to light fairly recently, hasn't That's it? That's right. A man was seen running down Trinity Hill at about 25 past 10. It was unusual because of his ice on the ground and uh, how he stayed on his feet has been subject to speculation. He ran to a bus stop, asked about a Sunday service, but then in fact didn't wait at the bus stop, he walked off. He was wearing uh, this tracksuit, a purple tracksuit with uh, yellow stripes down the arm. It, we think it's quite an unusual tracksuit. What did he look like? He was a white man, aged about 19 to 25. He was about 5 foot 8 inches tall and he had black hair which was short and was brushed forward. Now another sighting you're keen to get information on and that's a man driving a dark blue Ford Fiesta. That's correct. It's a Mark II Ford Fiesta, possibly an A registration. That was seen to drive off about 100 yards away from the scene. So it, it is distinctive uh, in as much as it is a dark blue uh, Fiesta, it has got moulding around the bottom of the car and the exhaust was either blowing or in fact what they call a wide bore exhaust, it was very noisy. Now it's important to stress that you do have DNA evidence in this case, so you can easily eliminate someone if they're not your man, That's right. You? We certainly can eliminate people quite easily. So you want help on these sightings. How else can people help? Well, I find it hard to believe that somebody who's committed such a horrendous crime can't or will not have changed their, their, their lifestyle, their pattern of behaviour. Anybody who's got any worry about their neighbour, their friends, their uh, boyfriend or something like that, then please contact us. I say we can eliminate them. Because this was a young girl, Nicola, in the prime of her life, just 17 years old, That's innocently right. going down to a pub to sell New Year's Eve. I mean, she was a lovely girl, wasn't she? She was very well regarded by all her friends. Uh, she was studying A-levels, hoping to go on and do photography, and there's no doubt she's a typical teenager and a lovely girl. Kelvin Roberts, thank you very much indeed. Now please, here's the number. If there's anything you think you contribute at all, 0500 600 600 is our free call number directly here to the studio, and that's of course good for any of our cases this evening. Or call the Incident Room direct on 0121 322 6104. That's 0121 322 6104. Now to Merseyside and to the Wirral. Someone in the area is violently disturbed, but may not show it. Two weeks before Christmas, he indulged in a calculated, ritualistic murder. But his behavior at the scene was so controlled, it's possible he showed no signs to his friends of what he'd done. Now, perhaps you know someone who maybe is generally a little odd, who lives in the area, who acted strangely in the past, and perhaps he has a history of trouble and has previously been violent. His victim was 74-year-old Alice Rye from Spittle, 
and many of her neighbours have helped us reconstruct what happened. Alice had been recruited to the Women's Institute by her close friend and neighbour, Phyllis Kellett. When we went to meetings and they were asking for people to be on the committee and I was saying, come on Alice, let your name go forward. And she'd be saying, oh no, no, I couldn't go on a committee. And she did get onto the committee, of course. Oh, New Year. Oh, how lovely. So I'm planning a long break down with my, one of my daughters. Oh, your daughter's down in Surrey. It's going to be oh, lovely. lovely. Alice was born and bred in Newborough, North Wales. She trained as a wartime nurse with her sister Anne. I'm the eldest. But she, she's only 15 months younger than me. But she could put me in my place, mind you. She was that type of girl. We were very, very near. We did everything together, but she got married during the war, 1944, and travelled the world with her husband. Her husband, Colin, died in 1986, and Alice turned more than ever to her neighbours. If there was any social occasion, we might go together, and we helped each other when we could, when she was away, which was quite a lot with the family. I just went into her house, you know, and just had a look all round and did whatever was necessary. Yes, it's me. I've just been in to see Geoffrey. So I thought I'd pop in and see you too. Not disturbing you, have I? No, of course not. Come I'm on in. Right here. I called in on the Sunday because I said I won't be able to see you for a few days, but come if you need anything. I'm going to be away for a whole month. So that was how it was, you see, and it was just a kind of help each other relationship. Two days later, Tuesday the 10th, and Alice was out and about as usual. I can't stop Alice, I'm just going to catch the post. Oh, I do. I'll catch you some other time. That afternoon, I didn't see Alice go out, but usually she would have a walk around the estate, a fairly long walk. Well, I knew Alice from church. I did come along Poulton Road in good time to meet my grandson from school. So I was driving quite slowly when I saw Alice coming out of the slip road. This is the last known sighting of Alice alive. Whilst I was doing the vegetables, I heard this almost like a wailing noise, and it, it went up to a crescendo, as though somebody was in pain. It came three times, and I thought, if that happens again, I must do something about it. But it didn't. So I just went in and didn't think anything more about it. Forty-five minutes later, these local residents were driving past the slip road that leads to Alice's house on Poulton Road. I had a hospital appointment at six o'clock. And if we go down the lever course, just as we got to near the slip road, a man walked out in front of us, completely oblivious to anything that was going on. He was about five foot eleven, late twenties, early thirties, quite powerfully built, his hair shortish but wavy at the side. His eyes were focused on the other side of the road and he just kept walking. Didn't react at all. This was what was so strange. This couple were returning home just opposite Alice's house. 
I wonder who these are. I have no idea. I was suspicious when I saw the car simply because it was parked in a place where visitors don't normally park. I was a bit unnerved at this. I just felt dubious of their presence. Do you think we should call the police? I wouldn't worry about it, love. Let's go in. No, I don't like it. Can you eliminate the two people in the white car? After a few minutes, the car came into the drive. There were a young couple in their 20s. He was slim-featured. He had dark hair, swept back, and she was a young girl with a fuller face. She had shoulder-length hair, which looked brown. At 8 o'clock next morning, I looked out and noticed that the gates were open. And I began to wonder why. By this time, I was quite concerned in that there was something not as it should be. I went upstairs. I just simply froze at the horror of what I saw. Alice's body was in the spare room. She'd been stabbed and by now had been dead for some hours. I'm trying to pretend that she's still there. And then it comes over you that she's not there. But that's the only way I think I can live, is to pretend that she still is. And what else can I do? Nothing else I can do is there. George Denson, what can we do? We need to eliminate these people from the inquiry. I don't think there might be anything sinister. Uh, in these sightings, but we need the, them to come forward so we can do that. So that's the guy who was walking across the road, not paying a lot of, seemingly in his own thoughts, not paying much attention to the traffic, and the couple in the in the white car. That's correct, yes. Tuesday, the 10th of December. Now, some things were left in the house, and some things were taken from, from Alice's house. They're obviously a good clue. Tell us about this first, which was left this in is Alice's a, place. This is a copy of a triangular bandage, which we believe the offender left at the scene. Now, you don't want to know where triangular bandages come from. They're, these brought anywhere. This had bits cut off it. Corners there. This was a triangle which, obviously, there's a bit missing there. That's up, right. up, up here. It's been deliberately cut with, a, obviously, a blunt pair of scissors or, or some instrument. And uh, what we need to know is, has anybody seen the missing pieces of this particular bandage? Not pleased to ring us if you've just seen a piece of bandage. Does it connect with something that we've said tonight, perhaps in the introduction about the sort of man that might be responsible? Now, what about the things that were, were taken? I, I know this is very, very important. Des describe why this is significant to me, will you? Yes, this is... Uh, Alice's husband had four of these made from one long chain. So, so four of these identical ones? Identical ones. So in that sense, they're unique. We know Alice very rarely took hers off, not even for bed. It's missing from the body and um, we know where three of them are we, with her uh, three daughters, two daughters and uh, daughter-in-law, so we need to know where the missing bracelet is. So if you've seen this, you could lead us to the killer. It could indeed. Her watch is missing too, yeah? Yes, that's a lady's um, Omega watch with a gold bracelet and a champagne face. Okay. And there is a small gold um, brooch which has three pearls running through the centre and she would use that to clip her scarf to her um, cardigan. All of this is a very long shot, perhaps the longest of all. Her travel zone, motorside travel zone, it, uh, pass is missing. If you've seen that, would have her details on the back of it, her access card and other details. This man has to be caught. If you've any suggestions, please call us right away. There's the number, the free call line's here to the studio, or you can ring the incident room in Wallasey. That's on 0151 777 2920. 0151 777 2920. People get annoyed when we read of British tourists being targeted by criminals abroad. Well, here's a chance to stop it happening in reverse. 
we've got clear pictures of three villains who are causing a lot of problems to visitors to London. Here's a businessman checking into a hotel. Note the bystander who looks a little out of place, but he's eyeing the man's luggage. Then his two accomplices come in. They exchange a glance and then the, the two more smartly dressed men go into a routine. One hides behind the other and then ducks down to steal the bag. They're very good images and a lot of people must recognise them. There's a number, do give us a ring right now on 0500 600 600 or call the local police on 0181 246 0060. That's 0181 246 0060. At the start, we said that there'd been arrests within hours of last month's programme. Now, you may recall pictures of a man in the children's department of a bookshop. Well, after calls to the studio, officers worked throughout the night, and at a quarter past six next morning, a man was arrested in North London. Three hours later, a man walked into a police station in Manchester after our appeal about a series of serious sexual offences. Well, he is now awaiting trial on charges of rape, threats to kill, and grievous bodily harm. And at North Wales Police Headquarters, Quarters in Colwyn Bay, the third call they took after our reconstruction of a rape in Prestatin led to a local man who has been charged with two separate offences. 110 viewers rang about the lorry hijack in South London. That was foiled by passers-by. And out of 35 names put forward, 19 have so far been eliminated, but police say some of the remaining 16 look quite promising. And 116 calls followed our appeal about a bank raid in Dundee. That was the reconstruction we're actually snowed in August while we were filming. Now, significantly, two men have been eliminated from security video at a petrol station on the A90, and it looks like a new and important witness has come forward. Then there was this man, John William Hogg. Now, lots of viewers seem to know him. In fact, someone tipped us off that he was due at a meeting in Hertfordshire the following morning, but he didn't turn up. On the other hand, he has been seen twice in the Lake District and in Dorset and he may still have his beige Peugeot 205, registration F623JFJ. If you know where he is tonight, do call. Now here's Detective Constable Jackie Hames. If you'd stolen from a fragile pensioner, you might think you'd feel ashamed or at least be worried about getting caught. But not a couple operating in Hertfordshire. They picked the pocket of a 91-year-old woman who was shopping in the local supermarket. They tried to forge her shit signature on a credit card and then they argued with shop staff who challenged them. This is the couple. They've a pushchair, though you never see a child in it. The staff are rightly suspicious, but the couple won't give up. In fact, they're on camera for half an hour. And when the woman does give up, the man continues the argument with customer services. The woman has turned up on uh, lots of other security videos in the St Albans area, but who is she? The man is in his mid-twenties and is five foot ten. We're on 0500 600 600. The incident room is on 01727 796 064. That's in Albans, 796 064. Our next case is an assassination, a murder to order by the look of it, but no one is quite sure why. Did the hitman go for the wrong target? Was an earlier attack unconnected, perhaps just a bad coincidence? In the two months since Richard Watson was shot, detectives haven't come across anything that might be a motive. What they need now is people, friends, family, acquaintances who know anything that could be a key to his murder. Hmm. Is this, the lot from this is Trafalgar Computers, one of the best-known traders in used computer hardware. It was founded by Richard Watson seven years ago. Dad? Yeah. Uh, just hold back a second. Yes, Jim? Is this part of the shipment to go via Peterborough? Yes, all this lot here. Um, I started working with Dad in March last year. He bought and sold predominantly second-hand mainframe computer equipment, and it was an opportunity to spend more time with each other. I think he regarded the job as a as a hobby more than anything. And he actually woke up in the morning and he was the kind of person that would uh, wake up and say, great, I'm going to work this morning. I love it. Richard lived here in East Grinstead, Sussex. He'd been married for 11 years to his third wife, Linda. Dad was quite flamboyant. He, um, he had good fun. And everyone that he did business with always thought that he was good fun to work with. Whatever he said he was going to do, he always did it and he never reneged on, uh, on uh, anything that he said he was going to do. Uh, completely honest and straightforward. And uh, even if it would mean that a certain deal would make a loss, if he had to fulfil his commitments, he would do so. We've got some stuff we're sending over next week. Mm-hmm. 
Yes, wonderful. Yes. Yes, it's going very well. Very well. Yes, a noisy market, as they say. Mm. We uh, were normally the last people in the office, Dad good. and I. Good. And at the end of the day, when the phone stopped ringing and everything went quiet, we'd have a five or ten minute chat. Stansted or East Midlands, possibly, don't know yet. I'll tell you what, Jim, you go ahead, I'll lock up, all right? You sure? Yes, quite sure. Sorry, just saying goodbye to Julian. Yes, oh, good. Yes, I, I, well, I thought... Across the road, the day was winding down as well. I work as a mechanic for Pat's Garage. That particular evening, I left about six o'clock. Bye. I got in the car, I come up the Charwoods Road. I saw two men running across the forecourt of Mr. Watson's factory. One was a coloured chap, the second one was a white chap. Late teens, early twenties, both about five, six, five, eight. That night, though it's not known how or where it happened, a tyre on Richard's car was punctured. Had it been tampered with? He was obviously very shocked, which he tried to hide. It was something that baffled us all. We, uh, uh, the two chaps that did it, uh, they didn't steal anything. They, um, they didn't attempt to get into the building. Um, and they didn't say anything either to dad or to each other. Um, which made it even more confusing. Three weeks later, Tuesday, December the 10th, a day which Richard spent largely in his car, driving to see customers in Rickmansworth and Peterborough. Hello? Oh, Julian, yes, hello. Hi. Yes, I am. Yes, that's it. And we come to a mini roundabout, you say, and we turn left. Good. Richard was expected home in East Grinstead, as usual, at half past six. On the lane behind the Watsons' house, a neighbour was also coming back from work. I was driving home about twenty past six. As we were coming up Sandhorse Hill, we saw a man who was standing on the very dangerous bend. He was about five foot eleven, in his early thirties, dark hair, with a long, thin face. I can't imagine what he was doing except to use the footpaths that come out near to Mr. Watson's house. But Richard was an hour late. He stopped for petrol eight miles from home at 20 past seven. Hello? Hi! Where are you? I'm at Blind Heath with Julian, yes. I've just got to drop him off at the office, then I'll be home. Fine. Okay. Yeah, I'll get the drinks on the go. Bye. Richard had been killed at close range with a shotgun. A few hundred yards away, a man was seen struggling with a holdall. Was this the assassin? 
we as a family can't understand why this has happened. And it is at the moment apparently motiveless. And we need for our peace of mind to, to find out why it has happened. And, and Dad needs to, to have justice. Paul Westwood, Richard Watson was well known locally, to all intents and purposes he was well liked. Yes. Who would want to kill him? Well, all the information we've had so far is that Richard Watson was an honest, uh, well-respected businessman. He was well liked in his profession. He was a good family man. He had no enemies. So really it's a mystery as to why he should be killed or why anybody would want to kill him. I should say an incentive here, as if an incentive is needed, is a rather substantial reward. On offer. Yes, the family put up £10,000 as a reward and Sussex Police have put up a further £10,000 and since then Linda, his widow, has put up a further £30,000. So who are you appealing to in particular then? Well, we know that Richard Watson was in, had, had been working in the computer business for 20 years and for the last seven or eight years he worked as himself and was quite successful. What we really need to know is from anybody who's had any dealings with him in his business life or knows anything about his personal life which may have some ideas or some give some motive as to why he was murdered. You've had one call from someone called Tom who you'd like to hear from again. Yes, indeed. Uh, some time ago, a man calling himself Tom rang into our incident room and gave us some very good information. Unfortunately, he didn't give us a lot. We believe he can tell us a lot more. So one of our appeals is for Tom to contact us again, please. We really need to hear from him. Well, let's hope he's watching tonight and, and does something about that. Now, that first attack on Richard Watson that we saw in the film three weeks previously when those two man with, men with balaclavas attacked him with a stun gun. Right. I mean, was it a coincidence or do you think it was linked? Well, we don't know if it was connected. What we do know is that we need to identify those two men. Um, we, we need to eliminate them from what is really a serious murder inquiry, so we need to know who they were. So basically, they better come forward because otherwise they are suspects in a murder, if they, of course, they weren't, right, yeah. they weren't the murderers. Now, the man seen in the bushes on the night of the murder, how yes. significant was he? Well, that is very interesting. It is significant because two reasons, where he was seen and the time. It was seen at 6.20pm, which is about 10 minutes before Richard normally gets home. And he was in an area which is immediately behind Richard's house. Um, he was seen by two people, actually. The first person who described him on the film and the second person who saw him, but he thought he may have been wearing either a balaclava or it may have been a hood. Mm, but one, it is interesting. Yes, and the person that you really, really want to track down is the man seen running away. Yes, now that is the one I really need to find out. This is a man who was seen running along Holtai Road in East Grinstead, away from Richard's home, and he was about 150 yards away from Richard's house. And he was seen to be struggling with a hold door, which could have carried a shotgun. Uh, he was wearing a balaclava. Now I need to know who he is, what he was doing there, and where he went. Well, Paul Westwood, thank you very much indeed. Do remember, there is a substantial reward here. If you can help, if your name is Tom, and you rang them earlier, do call back. If you can help in any way, please ring Mr. Westwood or any of his colleagues here. 0500 600 600, that's 0500 600 600. Or you can reach other members of the team at the incident room in West Sussex, that's on 0144 four four double four five nine hundred that's Haywards Heath double four five nine hundred I have notes here of a remarkable call on the Alice Rye murder it's patently sincere until it's checked out it's hard to know whether the caller is right but if the caller is right that's very important indeed lots of other calls on the Alice Rye particularly on the white car somebody thinks it's theirs on Nicola Dixon we've got six names now put forward uh, ten names have been put forward for the EFIT on uh, Alice Rye the London Hotel thefts we've got three names on that three names to the female in the St Albans theft now here's Superintendent David Hatcher demanding money with menaces. Well, at any rate, asking for your help to find who is. First, this man. It's a clear image taken from a bank in Sudbury in Suffolk. He's just threatened the cashier with a gun and he's being handed a small bundle of cash which he's stuffing into a black sports bag. His average height, five foot nine. The glasses are probably not part of a disguise and it's unlikely he's local. Several hundred viewers must have a good idea who this is, so do tell us on 0500 600 600 or phone the Suffolk Police on 01284 774 350. That's Bury St Edmunds 774 350. And from Suffolk to Hitchin in Hertfordshire. About a month ago, this man walked yes. into a building society and produced a kitchen knife. He was scared off when the alarm was activated. But who is he? He's about 60 and short.
under five foot five. Do you know who'd threaten a young cashier with a 10 inch blade? If so, 0500 600 600 or call 01462 425 167. That's Hitchin 425 167. And now to Peterborough in Cambridgeshire, in fact to a suburban area of Peterborough just north of the city centre. For the last two months there's been a series of house fires. All of them were started deliberately with burning paper pushed through letterboxes. There have been 16 attacks so far, with some places badly damaged and in three cases families have had to be rescued from their blazing homes. Two people have finished up in hospital. And the truth is, you've not got an awful lot to, to go on on this. The best perhaps is what you've got from a forensic psychologist. Tell us, tell us about that. Yes, the, the best thing we've got to go on really is that um, uh, th they're telling us the three out of four serial ar uh, arsonists are male. He's likely to be a loner, a bit of an oddball character, um, and the uh, type of offences he's committed are, are unplanned and impulsive. He's more than likely local to the Walton Warrington area, and what we are certain of is that uh, he is dangerous and won't stop till he's caught. <coughs> He's likely to continue to commit offences until he is caught. Now, there was somebody seen in the area who could be significant. Just tell us about this man. Right, there was a person seen uh, in the area the night following the most recent uh, arson attack. Uh, he's in his early 20s, 5 foot 7 tall, short black hair, wearing a hoop sweatshirt with a two-tone blue and white. Everything there except a swag bag. Now, this guy dumped stuff behind a hedge and just see if you recognise any of this clothing. Obviously, if someone had a balaclava like that with holes cut in it, you might be a bit suspicious. Maybe that's the side you saw. If you can link it to with this, this black uh, and white check sh scarf, and this, which is a Ralph Lauren polo wind cheater, or perhaps it's, it's a fake one, I don't know, but it's got the distinctive logo here. It's extra large or large size. Can you link all those together with somebody in the Peterborough area who doesn't have these anymore? And tell us about this, this, what is this called? This uh, toothache tincture that was found in one of the pockets. Yes, that, we know that was uh, bought from a, a store in Mayor's Walk in Peterborough, about two miles from where the arsons are, a local small chemists. So if anybody knows somebody, who's had a toothache or would have bought one of those, might have lost this clothing, looks like that artist's impression or can link in any way. Somebody's behaviour might be a bit odd. Our free call number to the studio is 0500 600 600. Mr Harrison has colleagues taking calls here. Others are standing by in Peterborough. The number there is 01733 63232. That's Peterborough 63232. Now to a murder that sparked street riots nearly two years ago on Merseyside. On Monday the 1st of May 1995, in Liverpool 8, David Ungi was shot dead in the street by at least two assailants. A black Golf VR6 was seen in the area, registration K459JVW. It hasn't been seen since and neither have the two men who were thought to be its occupants. Barry Kevin O'Rourke is 27, 5 foot 9, and at one time had a goatee beard and a snark moustache. This is what he looks like without them. Darren James Jackson is 19 and 5 foot 6, with short black hair. Both have Liverpool accents and they could be anywhere at all. If you know where they are, 0500 600 600, or call the local police direct on 0151 777 5351. That's Liverpool 777 5351. Also in Liverpool, this man, Arthur Aldridge, is wanted in connection with a $20 million international counterfeiting scam. He also is wanted, wanted in France for a major drug trafficking offence. He's 49, 5 foot 10, and is often known as Archie. He has a strong Liverpool accent. You may have seen him in ports or airports in the UK or in Europe. 0500 600 600 or the regional crime squad in Liverpool on 0151 777 555. That's Liverpool 777 555. Now why should a sales rep carrying jewellery be ambushed on a trip that he hadn't planned to make? Well that's one of the many mysteries in our next case. Another is why five men should make such a show of acting suspiciously in the hour before the robbery took place. Now the rep had been in the trade for 40 years, he's never had any trouble before, and his decision to see a customer in Blackpool was made only a day in advance of his visit. But there have been several jewellery robberies in the northwest of England, so maybe if you can help solve this, you can help solve several other crimes as well. Mike's company is based in Birmingham, but his patch covers the north of England, Scotland and Northern Ireland. We're probably the most famous 
jewelry manufacturer in the UK, and we use high quality material and gems. And uh, yes, it's very very nice to handle it. You're practically upset sometime when you when you sell a piece and they want to take it out of your case, and you know for well you won't get another one for four weeks. It's uh, very nice handling the real stuff, yeah. On November the 12th, the Tuesday, he was on his way to Cole, the jeweller, in Blackpool, where the manager was opening for the day as usual. Good morning, Cole, the jewellers. In the cafe opposite, three regulars were at their usual table. We came in at quarter past nine, about ten minutes later. The two guys came in and sat on the table in the window. It's only three letters, I think you'd be able to get well, I think one, it's yeah. keg. keg one could hold beer. About five, ten minutes later after that, three other guys came in. I've been coming in here every morning and I've never noticed, like, two and then three come in like that. At ten o'clock, Mike arrived and looked around for a place to park. He found a spot just round the corner in Orchard Avenue. We're going last. Do you want our table? No, it's all right. Okay. <laughs> it's getting a bit tight for Christmas, but certainly anything you wanted to, uh, today, we can get you by there, no trouble. OK, Matt, well, we'll start with lockets and tie slides. I think I need some gaps filling there. That and that and you. That one, let me think. Yes, we have sold that. Uh, what's the reference? 3694. Uh, 36. Right, yeah. One of the men now decided to buy a pack of cigarettes, a decision which might cost him dearly. He was caught on the shop's camera. If you can name him, please call us now. He's mid-forties, five foot nine, medium build with greying hair. Well, he shouldn't leave it too long. I know he's been very busy, but when I see him, I'll give his memory a little jog. Yeah, OK. Well, it's no great rush. It'll take its own course, I'm sure. Yeah. No problem there. Soon after, all five men left the cafe. In Orchard Avenue, Eileen White, a nurse, saw three men who seemed to her suspicious. As I walked up to them, one of the men crossed the road and started looking into a car. I carried on walking and I thought, now oh, what's he up to? Is he going to pinch that car? As I got up to the two men, I had a good look at them. But they were older than I thought they were, and I thought, old men don't pinch cars. I just carried on going. As I got to the corner, I turned back to have another look, and the two men were stood watching me, and I couldn't see the younger one. So, what are you doing for Christmas? Well, I'm going to be at home. Uh, just with the family, just a normal thing. Are you going to be away? Oh, no, no, I shall do the same quiet Christmas home with the family, but staying right. in one place and yes, not working. Meanwhile, in an alley behind the cafe... I reversed back as far as I could, walked round my vehicle, and then saw that there were two people sat in this car, and thought it strange that neither of them sort of said, are we in your way or should we move? They just sort of sat there as though they were waiting for something but didn't want to see me. <laughs> Morning, Michael. These lads waiting on you. That's now. Nothing to do with us. I thought to myself, got to get down the road now to Skirkham. And I should be there before lunchtime. I was thinking that this bugger's pulled right over to let another car come the other way. And he's he clapped my wing mirror. And I went and opened the door, and that was it. Hey! Hey! Hey!
Police. I'm a jewellery rep. I've just had the stock sold for my car in Orchard Avenue. At first, you're numb. And then all of a sudden, slightly afterwards, you just don't feel as though you've got stomach cramps. Feeling all tight up inside. But just now? They'd pinch something that belonged to me. I look after that, like look after a baby, you know? I don't know, I don't think I can explain it really. I think anybody who steals it for anybody else is getting it without working for it. And I've worked for it 40 years. Now, Cass Ben, that uh, getaway car, the Renault, was found a short time later, wasn't it? Yes, it was. The offender's car was found within half an hour of the actual offence. It was parked outside Pets at Home, which is near to Morrison's on the Squiresgate Lane Industrial Estate at Blackpool. It had been reversed in pos into position and locked, suggesting that the offenders perhaps were going to come back to the vehicle. However, this never happened. The vehicle hasn't been reported stolen. So you believe it belonged to a member of the gang? That's right, yes. What sort of history has it got to your knowledge? We know that the vehicle was sold in the middle of May last year in Altringham, Manchester, to a man who is described as 40 to 43 years, a stocky build, and he has a Scottish accent. And it was taxed a couple of months after that? Yes, on July the 2nd last year, it was taxed under a false name in the main post office in Manchester. So basically it's been in the possession of someone from May until the robbery in November. That's right, and it's strange that offenders should hold on to a vehicle for that length of time. Mm. Now, what about those five men acting suspiciously in the cafe? Do you believe that they are the same people who committed this robbery? We do believe that at this stage, and we're trying to trace them. So what do you know about the man who, unfortunately for him, was actually caught on that security camera? That's right, the man who left the shop, the cafe, to go next door to the shop to buy some cigarettes, was caught on the camera, and he's described as mid-40s, five foot nine, a medium build with grey hair. And what do you know about the driver of the car? He's described as 50 years, quite tall, a stocky build, and he's clean-shaven with brown hair. Now let's take a look at some of the jewellery that was stolen. Now this is manufactured by, by only one company in Britain, isn't it? That's right, it's actually unique to that company. So it's very distinctive, and if you get offered any jewellery like this, if you're a dealer, and you're offered anything like this other than by a bona fide rep, then be on your guard. Take a look at this, for example, a very distinctive locket which turns and twists like that. And again, quite a distinctive pattern. So be aware that uh, if you get offered something like this, it may be stolen. Well, here is the number, 0500 600 600. There is a reward here as well. Now, that's to Kath Ben's team, the number here in the studio, 0500 600 600. Or you can call her colleagues, they're standing by in Blackpool. They're on 01772 410 828. That's Preston, 410 828. The phone lines are open until midnight, and that's the number for any of our cases. You'll find other numbers listed under CFAX on page 621. Our electronic mailbox is crimewatchuk at bbc, or more precisely, cwuk at bbc.co.uk. And if you've uh, any information on a crime we haven't covered, then try Crime Stoppers. They're on 0800 treble 5 treble 1. That's Crime Stoppers, 0800 treble 5 treble 1, where we'll be back in half an hour, we hope, with some results. That's Crime Watch update at a quarter past 11. That's beyond your bedtime. We'll see you exactly a month from now, we hope. Tuesday, March the 11th. Till then, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night. First on BBC One, it's back to the Crime Watch studio for tonight's update.
Hello and welcome back. Police are on the road now to arrest at least one suspect as a direct result of viewers' calls for obvious reasons. I can't say which case is involved. On the murder of the businessman Richard Watson, we've got a new witness and new information from a business associate. On the arson attacks on homes in Peterborough, we've at least two names, I think maybe three now, that seem especially promising. In fact, on almost every case, there have been developments since we came off the air. Jill. And first, the death of Nicola Dixon, the teenager killed on New Year's Eve near her home in Sutton Coldfield in the West Midlands. Nicola was walking from a party to meet some friends at a pub when she was attacked. Well, Kelvin Roberts is running the inquiry and has been going through the calls here to the studio. Any good leads so far this evening? Yes, we have some very interesting calls. The two calls in particular named somebody that uh, we, we've not heard of before, and obviously that will be followed up very quickly. And you've had some interesting leads on this particular tracksuit worn by someone you're interested in. That's right. This, the person wearing this tracksuit was seen to run down. Trinity Hill at about 25 past uh, 10 um, and then apparently asked for a night uh, for a bus but the it's been suggested the tracksuits uh, may belong to the army and uh, in fact there is an old barracks in Sutton Colford so clearly that's a, that's a line that we must follow up as any calls on the blue fiesta the man seen driving the blue fiesta there's been, been a couple but if I can just repeat that fiesta it is quite distinctive it's dark blue it's got the molding around the bottom of the car and it has got this wide bore or noisy exhaust the man himself was uh, a white man uh, mid mid 20s five foot ten tall, wearing a bomber jacket and, and possibly blue jeans. He had mousy coloured hair. Right, well let's hope you get some further calls. Thank, Thank you very you. much indeed. Now the hunt for someone who carried out a ritualistic murder in the Wirral on Merseyside. His victim was 74-year-old Alice Rye, who was found the following day by one of her neighbours. Alice? George Denton Precious little to go on, few witnesses, a really thin appeal, quite a lot of calls though. We've had a good response tonight, I'm very pleased with it. Um, mostly about the EFIT. Um, the, that was the EFIT of uh, a picture of somebody who was seen running across, or actually walking across right, the road, yes. just uh, by Alice, Alice's house. That's right. You want to eliminate that man? Indeed we do. We've got a lot of calls on him. Yes, go on, what else? Quite have a lot of names about the EFIT, um, quite a few suggestions about the bandage. Uh, this is a torn piece of bandage that... It, just like this, that you want to, to identify. That's right. And we've had one or two interesting ones, possibly about the bracelet. Now, this bracelet, it, this is not what, well, actually, this is identical to that which is missing because there were four of these cut from one necklace. We know where three are. This is indeed one of them. If you know where the fourth one is, you're probably going to lead to the murder. And you've had some calls about this. Yes, we've had one or two, which but, seem interesting, which need following up, which we'll prioritise and follow up as soon as we can. All right. Thanks very much. Well, first on that hotel theft, We've had uh, only three calls there, one with the name and the description that's being followed up now. Often it only takes one, so it hopefully may be a result. St Albans, well, we've had a large number of calls there. Several here enter the incident room have all given the same names and details, so that's very optimistic. On that hitching robbery, not a lot to say there, except that I reckon I'm holding the answer in my hand, and officers will be talking to him by tomorrow, I reckon. And then finally, on that Sudbury armed robbery, 11 calls, nine have given names, two of them are from police officers who think they've had dealings with these people before, so altogether very promising. Richard Watson was a businessman who, for no clear reason, was shot dead outside his house in Sussex as he drove home from a day at work. Well, he ran a computer company, a firm he'd set up from scratch eight years ago, and until his death he ran it with his son. Sorry, let's think about you. Yes, oh good. Remind us just sort of what sort of man he was. Well, everything we've been told about Richard was uh, a positive image. He was good, uh, a good family man. He was a, a fair businessman. He didn't rip anybody off. He insisted upon sharing a deal with everybody. And, and that we've got no reason to believe he had any enemies. And as I said before, we just don't know why somebody would want him killed. So have you been posted and pushed towards any new motive tonight? Well, tonight we've had a very good response, both here and in our incident room at Hayward Seath. And... Um, in, in particular, we've had one lady who has come forward who was a witness to the stun gun attack, but we still need to know who those two attackers were, the stun gun. We don't know who they are, and we need them to come forward and to eliminate themselves from a murder inquiry. You also need to know who the man was seen in the bushes near yes, Mr Watson's home, Sandler's Yes, that, that indeed. We still need to know who that man is, and as I said before, that is in a, you know the, the interesting position and the time where he was standing, and it, it, we still need to know about him. And there is a substantial reward here there as well. Is, and of course, we still need to know about the man, Tom. Right, let's hear from Tom. If you rang in before, and please ring us back. 
News about two Liverpool cases. Firstly, Barry O'Rourke and Darren Jackson wanted in connection with the murder in 1995. Over 15 calls, various sightings of these two, including one of the car, but one in particular looks very promising. And secondly, Arthur Leonard Aldridge wanted in connection with that £20 million counterfeiting scam. Over 10 calls, two sightings so far, but uh, we still need to know where he is now. If you know, please call us now. Next, the theft of jewellery from a sales rep visiting a shop in Blackpool. Mm -hmm. Kath Ben, what sort of response have you had tonight? We've had an excellent response to the man on the video. Several names have been put forward. We've also had interesting information from an ex-police officer naming four males in the northwest thought to be involved. Well, that's encouraging. And have you had any calls on the car that was uh, involved in the getaway? Yes, we've had several calls on the car. And I'd just like to reconfirm that we do believe that the vehicle was in the Altrincham area of Manchester from the middle of May last year until the offence. So there is a Manchester connection, a very strong Manchester collection, you believe? That's right. It, regarding the vehicle, there is. Just have a quick look at the jewellery. If you see anything like this, if you're offered any jewellery like this, other than by a bona fide dealer, then this is what you must look out for, because it's very distinctive and there's only one manufacturer in the country. So do be aware. Frankly, we weren't sure in the next case what response would have, because there's been so much local publicity on it, but there's certainly been a great deal of renewed interest. Starting in December, there's been a series of arson attacks on houses in the north of Peterborough in Cambridgeshire. And we showed this picture of a man seen acting suspiciously. We showed some clothing that he dumped. Is he the arsonist? Well, 16 homes have been attacked. Some were badly damaged. Two people have been taken to hospital. To Harrison, quite a lot of calls, actually. I think you've been quite pleased given how much as I say publicity it's already had? Yes quite a lot of calls and, and some names have been put, put forward to us which we're already aware of um, which are already in our in our investigation. Now that's always significant because in other words you've got something that at least possibly links them to the crime and now callers are giving you other possible Exactly, links. exactly and we've also got other names from three different areas of the country which are linking in with a, an article in a magazine referring to, to somebody who has had a problem son. A problem son has been setting fire to things. That's that right. seems a bit of a long shot. There should be someone who's already featured in a magazine article. I presume you've got to check it out there. We should have to check it out. And as I say, it comes from three different areas of the, co of the country <coughs> and it is talking about something relatively local to Peterborough. All right, thanks very much. John. Well, that's all for this month. Our lines are open for another 35 minutes and you'll see other numbers in a moment. They're also lifted, listed on CFAX on page 621. Now, if you have a computer and a modem, you can reach us at crimewatchuk at the BBC. That's CWUK at bbc.co.uk and if you've information on any crime that we haven't covered then you can always try Crime Stoppers they're on 0800 treble 5 treble 1 We will be back on Tuesday March the 11th Don't have nightmares, do sleep well Good night Good night <laughs>